Good afternoon. Um, I think we'll make a start. Thank you very much to everyone for struggling here through a fairly unpleasant evening out there. Um, uh, let me introduce our speaker uh, for this evening, uh, Professor Brian Nolan. Brian is director of the Oxford Martin Programme on Inequality and Prosperity. He's also director of the Employment, Equity and Growth Programme at the Institute for New Economic Thinking at the Oxford Martin School, as well as being professor of social policy at the University of Oxford. Um, he came to us uh, from University College Dublin, where he was principal of the College of Human Sciences. Um, his recent books um, span um, all, all aspects of this subject. He, he um, co-edited the Handbook of Economic Inequality, um, authored The Poverty and Deprivation in Europe um, with Christopher Whelan, and The Great Recession and the Distribution of Household Income in 2013. But his latest book uh, was published uh, earlier this year um, by OUP um, and gives us the title for this evening, um, Children of Austerity, Impact of the Great Recession on Child Poverty in Rich Countries. Now, Brian will talk to us for 35 to 40 minutes. Uh, there will be time for uh, some questions, and then more importantly, there'll be time to buy the book and have a drink next door. So I'll hand over now to Brian. Thank you very much, Julian, and thank you all for coming. So what's this book about? Well, it's about what it says. It's about what was the impact of the variously named Great Recession, financial crisis, and the very uh, uh, severe recession hitting the rich countries from late 2007, 2008, from which we're, we're only now um, emerging, and, and some are emerging rather more than others, as you will see from, from what I go on to say. <clears throat> so what, what this book set out to do was learn from the really quite re wide range of country experiences. Um, because there are many excellent in-depth studies of poverty in a longer term context and, and in more recent years in individual countries. But as I hope to convince you in the, in the course of the talk and send you off uh, uh, to buy the book, what you, what you see when you compare countries is really, a, uh, it's a very distinctive perspective. So this is a book which is co-edited by um, Bea Cantillon of the University of Antwerp and um, two uh, researchers at the UNICEF Innocenti Research Center in Florence, Kat Chen and uh, Ashus Handa, and, uh, and myself. And it was done in collaboration with and published in, uh, by OUP in collaboration with UNICEF. And uh, for obvious reasons, this is of central importance to their work. And many of you will be familiar with, for example, UNICEF's uh, report cards, which regularly update a range of indicators of child well-being, some of which will feature in, in the course of this uh, analysis. <clears throat> so what we wanted to do was look at the nature of the Great Recession as it rolled out across the rich countries, um, and, and very importantly, how different uh, countries responded to it. How did that impact on the measures that we have of child poverty? Indeed, what does that tell us about how we should be thinking about and measuring child poverty in the first place? In a, in a, if we provide an overview uh, across 41 rich countries uh, uh, of the OECD, but then look in depth at 11 of them. And, and there are then 11 chapters, one for each of these um, rich countries, written by, um, if you like, uh, lo local experts, bringing out um, some lessons for policy, which I'll try and highlight at the end, and uh, convince you that these are indeed lessons from this range of country experiences. <coughs> so each of the country experts was asked to write to a broadly common analytical frame so that we could put these chapters together into a, a comparative uh, frame. But of course, each also dwelled on uh, issues and uh, topics that were of very particular importance in their own country. And indeed, one of the things we asked them to do was talk about the extent to which child poverty is an issue in their country in the first place, whether it features in the policy debate and whether the experience of the Great Recession 
has put child poverty on the agenda. So the first, the first and central point to make is that this, this is not a controlled experiment in which a set of countries are exposed to a common shock and we see how effectively, for example, their social protection system and their, uh, their policy responses, how they respond to this common shock. Because the crucial point about the Great Recession, in this context and more broadly, is that it impacted very differently on different countries. So the first thing is, what was the nature of the Great Recession? How did it impact on, for example, levels of employment and unemployment, on incomes uh, of, of households, and, and then think about how did that filter through to families and children. But countries, of course, not only did they vary in the nature and, and depth of the shock, if you want to think about it that way, but they also differed in their responses. Partly because their own infrastructure differed. Some had more developed social security systems than others, which responded in an, if you like, automatic way, therefore rather differently. Some had much more extensive um, coverage and protection for those who, for example, see their incomes fall precipitately or lose, lose their jobs than others. So the reaction is bound to be different from that point of view, but also policy choices were different. Different countries made really rather different sets of decisions about how to change not just spending on social transfers, their tax system, but also how they responded to, for example, the challenge of uh, fiscal deficits and, and rising public debt. So we have to try and incorporate all of these features into understanding what we then see when we try and measure what happened to, um, to child poverty in these, this range of countries. So this is just a, a, a graphic that shows the decline in GDP per capita in real terms from peak to trough, from before the crisis to the, 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 the worst, the lowest point that the country in question hits during the crisis. <laughs> and that simply bring, serves to bring out that while there are a few countries at the very top there, notably Poland, that didn't see uh, a decline, that, that's very much the exception. Most countries saw some impact, but the countries that saw a peak to trough decline of the order of, say, 2%, are in a radically different situation from the country that I will be saying quite a bit about that registered a fall of fully one quarter in, in GDP per capita, uh, which, is, which is Greece. So these, these are very different crises, if you like, to think about it that way. And it's important to have that front and center as you think about the impact on children. And that carries through to the impact of the crisis on unemployment, where what this graphic shows is the increase in overall unemployment in the more faded left-hand bars there, and the um, increases in youth unemployment, almost always from a higher level, and often uh, a more substantial increase in, in the bolder arrows. Where you'll see um, these very badly uh, affected countries um, countries that we mostly are familiar with in terms of the, uh, uh, when we think about the countries that were worst affected, um, notably Spain, Greece, Italy, uh, Portugal, and uh, indeed uh, slightly further up this graphic, but not others, uh, my own country of Ireland. One of the main channels of transmission through which this sort of economic, macroeconomic shock an impact on the labor market feeds through to the incomes of households with children, and that's the main thing we'll be talking about, is through uh, households moving to a situation where there is little or no work, little or no paid work being done by anyone in the household. And you can see that here, uh, alas, uh, my own country is, uh, tops, tops the league with a, with a very high initial level of essentially jobless households, but also a very substantial increase. And this, this, more generally, is, as I say, a very central transmission mechanism. Not the only one, but a central transmission mechanism from the macroeconomic shock through to incomes for households with children. So how then do we want to think about measuring the 
immediate, at least the immediate impact of, of such a crisis, such a varying macro, macro shock on child poverty. Well, the, the, uh, we've now moved from a situation where uh, very often one would be focusing on one or two numbers, where now, in a sense, there's, there's a, a, a multitude of, alter, of complementary ways of measuring, trying to capture empirically um, the living standards and well-being of households, including with children, and in this context, see what deterioration there was, uh, if any, in the course of, of this recession. In, in a longer term context, we tend to focus, first of all, primarily on household income, but also frame that against uh, average or median income in the society in question. So when, uh, when uh, we think about the longer term, we tend to measure poverty in relation to the income of the household against a national standard framed against uh, what, other, what other households in that society have at that point in time. Now, for reasons that are obvious, that might make sense in a longer term uh, context where incomes are generally rising, but in a sharp recession of this sort where many incomes and indeed average or median income may well be falling, in some cases falling very substantially, Letting the poverty threshold fall alongside that uh, seems to miss much of what's actually happening to households and their living standards. So in that context, what tends to be used are what's called anchored income poverty thresholds, which are set in a variety of ways in, in the initial year and then moved only in line with prices. So if prices go up, that's taken into account, but uh, the purchasing power of the threshold is what remains fixed. And that gives you very different patterns in a, in a situation like the crisis in some countries where average incomes are really falling sometimes cal calamitously. But now, as I say, rather than relying purely on income, um, for, for most countries and at European Union uh, comparative level, um, there are a variety of non-monetary indicators of deprivation, most often at the level of the household. So we can judge whether children are in households where deprivation is increasing. What we would like to do, of course, is measure what's actually happening to the situation of the children themselves. And to some extent, that sort of information is available, although very often not in such a harmonized way and in ways that, uh, that, that differ over, over time and across countries. So what I'm going to be focusing on for the most part is these anchored poverty thresholds for the reasons that I, that I mentioned and argued on the slide. Now, you, you could argue that this, this, from a poverty measurement point of view, is in some sense trying to have it both ways. The poverty, the poverty threshold goes up when incomes go up, but it, 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 it holds fixed when incomes go down. And you, could, you, could, you can argue and we can discuss whether this is, in some sense, trying to have it both ways, but it seems to me to make, uh, to make sense particularly if you're complementing those income measures, as we do, with these non-monetary sorts of measures that, um, that I mentioned. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you try and absorb what's on this slide for 30-something countries for which we can carry out this comparison of uh, these, these fixed purchasing power thresholds comparing the level in 2008 with uh, the level in 2013-14. But what, what, it, what it, you can see very clearly is the range of changes that are registered by this range of countries, with some seeing little or no impact of the crisis on poverty measured against this fixed threshold, and others seeing very, very substantial increases. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to Greece many times. Um, but, but other countries also seeing rather marked increases in the course of the crisis. So that's, if you like, context setting, where we're thinking in terms of that overall pattern across the rich countries of the OECD. But we don't, have, apart from anything else, we don't have the full panoply of measures um, for non-EU countries. But also, it simply wouldn't be possible to look in the sort of depth that this book does at, uh, at 40 countries. What we did instead was we selected 11. 11 countries which vary 
um, in terms of their, what would conventionally be thought of as their, their welfare arrangements, their type of welfare state that is in operation, um, but also their um, average levels of income and their initial levels of child poverty, which I'll run very rapidly through, and then just try and give you a very brief pen picture of most of those countries. Um, but this, this is um, average income per head at the, uh, at the outset of the crisis, and it's simply to illustrate the fact that um, these countries vary a lot in, this, in that the United States has a, a rather higher income per head at the outset, and Hungary has a much lower level of income per head. And that's, that's clearly, clearly relevant to certainly deprivation levels, and, and with much less variation across these other countries. And I would have to embarrassedly ask you to ignore this number for Ireland and attribute it to what Paul Krugman calls uh, leprechaun economics, <laughs> or at least leprechaun statistical accounting. So this is what happened to the fixed purchasing power anchored poverty threshold based measure of poverty that I mentioned a moment ago. What, what I've done here is I've ranked the countries in terms of their initial level, which is simply a relative poverty threshold in the base year in 2008. And you can see that maybe we're not surprised anymore, but remarkably, um, the, the country with the, the uh, highest level of income per head is also the country with the highest level of uh, relative income poverty. And uh, at the other extreme, one of the other <laughs> highest income countries, um, Sweden, is, in a, is a, in a very different initial situation. With a, 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 a fair span of um, levels of initial anchored poverty, uh, of relative poverty, um, across those other countries. Now, I'll, I'll let you run your eye over the, what happened, but I'm going to talk it through country by country, so don't, don't feel under pressure to do so. Um, strikingly, what you see, of course, is that um, there are countries at the top where there was little or no impact, and countries mostly towards the bottom where there was a dramatic impact. But as I say, I will talk through most of those in a moment. But what about if we move away from income and we measure what you might think of as a more direct and obvious way of trying to capture living standards, if we simply look at what people can and can't afford to buy. So this is based on a, a set of nine non-monetary deprivation indicators that are now um, widely used at, at European Union level for the EU countries, uh, which uh, still includes the UK. And uh, some alternative indicators that are available for Japan and the USA. The first point to make is that the initial ranking, so I've ranked these again by the initial level, and the ranking is not identical to the ranking by income-based measures that we started with. But as we'll talk through, there are also some um, interesting differences in the extent and nature of the change over the period of the crisis. But again, we have some countries, notably these, the, these two at the top, um, uh, where there was little or no change in deprivation levels from the start to the most recent observation we have available. A little bit of a blip for Belgium, but really not much change. Remarkably, for Germany, deprivation just kept falling, uh, which, which is really very striking. But here we have uh, what really is a, a remarkably sorry tale. Uh, and uh, Hungary is also a, a country which registers a very substantial increase, although then a significant bounce back. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about Hungary and Japan um, for reasons of time. Um, Japan, in, in fact, is, is a rather... Uh, undramatic story in that there wasn't very much change in most of the indicators over the period, although there were some very interesting developments in the policy domain. But let me just try and give you, um, in, in rather, rather rapidly and in the, in the, the, the time available, a, a, a very brief summary of the in-depth analysis contained in the individual chapters 
for uh, the, the remaining nine countries. And I guess in, in rough terms, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be getting more and more depressing as we go in that I'm starting with the more positive uh, case study tales and ending with uh, some, some really very, uh, very grim ones. So Sweden is, a, Sweden is a very interesting case. You might think, well, Sweden, haven't they got the most developed welfare state that, that there is? So surely it isn't a surprise that we see really rather little change in income poverty um, and the deprivation from, actually kept falling through the crisis from an initial very low level. From a level, if you recall, sorry, there we are, from a level that's actually uh, less than half the level of any other country that I've shown here for a start. So it's already very low, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's, if anything, declining. The, the, the crucial point that the chapter, which is by um, uh, my Nuffy colleague, uh, Yanni Yonten and uh, Karina Mood, the point that it brings out very effectively is that Sweden had its crisis in the 1990s, uh, when it had a, 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 a bank crisis, a very sharp increase in unemployment, and a substantial increase in child poverty, as, as measured in these ways, despite what was then a, a very robust welfare state. So that brings out that in the uh, with a point that I'll keep repeating, and which we'll see illustrated gr graphically further on, that in the face of a very severe shock, even the most generous and comprehensive social protection system will, will regal, really struggle to cope. Now, Sweden doesn't have as robust a social protection system anymore as it did then, because one of the reactions and responses to the 1990s crisis was to cut back uh, on, on, on welfare provision. But despite that, the macro impact of this crisis was very muted. There was a very modest fall in average income and only a, a small blip in unemployment and a very rapid bounce back. So there wasn't much of a macro shock to respond to is the key thing about, um, ab about Sweden. Uh, and, and the other point that, again, is brought out very effectively in the chapter, which I think is, 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 a, is, a, is really well worth studying, not necessarily in a crisis context, but to understand uh, child poverty in a, 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 a highly developed welfare state like Norway's, it's highly concentrated among very specific population groups, notably um, lone parents and relatively recent immigrants. And, and the argument is made that even though Sweden takes uh, severely disadvantaged migrants, much more so than most other countries, that the child poverty rate remains high, but that they actually do get integrated relatively quickly when you take into account their initial level of, of education and skills. So it's an interesting story, even though on the face of it, it's a case of nothing much happens. Belgium is another very interesting story, which uh, is, is supportive of the effectiveness of a robust, generous, comprehensive social protection system, but also uh, an initial policy that responded to the macroeconomic shock by, um, by particularly concentrating on trying to minimize the impact on jobs and, and essentially incentivize firms to hold on to their, their workers rather than lay them off. So there was, as I think I mentioned, some increase in deprivation, but not much, and it was temporary. And for the most part, Belgium, although it was a more severe shock than in the case of Sweden, um, came through quite quickly and in a relatively uh, robust uh, um, health. Although child poverty is actually um, not as low as you would expect, given the generosity uh, uh, of the social protection system, for reasons that we can come back to. And Germany, again, is a very positive story um, for, for interestingly different uh, uh, reasons, in that there was a, a, a marked impact on GDP uh, and household incomes, indeed, 
Um, but, but virtually no rise in unemployment at all. And that was for two reasons, at, at, at least two main reasons. One was, despite the um, reputation uh, for uh, aversion to anything that smacks of fiscal stimulus, Germany actually indulged in a, a series of, of fiscal stimuli in the, in the immediate uh, face of the economic crisis. And this included, for example, once-off payments to, to, to families and tax relief aimed at families with children. But they also, as you, uh, many of you will be aware, had a highly structured and coordinated and very successful attempt to, to ensure that firms held on to their workers and that, work, that where there was a reduction in work, it was in working time rather than in employment. And firms were uh, uh, assisted in an agreed, coordinated manner um, in holding on to their workers, keeping them on the books, working them part-time, and having the state uh, pay 60% of the uh, income loss that the workers would otherwise have suffered. But the degree of coordination that this required is really, is really quite remarkable, and as the chapter brings out, gives the lie to the notion that the German social model is, it has been entirely overturned by um, the, uh, for example, uh, market liberalization and social protection reforms uh, in, the, in the early to mid 2000s. Though again, like Sweden, the social protection system is, is now less robust than it was before those, um, before those reforms. So what about the, where, where, the UK? So we're, we're now sort of in the middle, I guess, uh, probably still in the relatively, relatively well-performing group, but towards the tail end of it before we move on to the really bad news. So what's interesting about the UK is that there was a, it was a substantial macroeconomic shock by any standards. Um, with a, a, a quite marked immediate decline in incomes, uh, prolonged uh, effects in, in terms of income taking a long time to come back to the pre-crisis level, and a pretty substantial um, increase in unemployment. Now, the chapter makes the point, chapter by Jonathan Bradshaw and colleagues um, from the University of York, makes the point that the initial impact was moderated, first of all, by um, fiscal stimulus, but also by uh, early, early operating of so social transfer support trades. And that when unemployment start, when employment started to recover, there was a, a very marked change in policy, of course, in 2010, where from that point onwards, it was uh, it, public spending cuts more generally, but including cuts, uh, uh, deep cuts to social transfers, and, and in particular, family-related benefits, um, uh, where, where the policy from that point onwards. Now, the chapter, I think, is, is, is slightly um, struggles with the fact that despite this, income-based measures of poverty didn't rise, but at least before housing costs, the, often in the UK, as you know, the measures of poverty focus on after housing costs, where there was some rise. That's a, that's a, a UK peculiarity, if you like, in terms of measurement. But le household levels of deprivation did show some increase. There are also available some indicators focusing specifically on the children rather than on their households. Um, and um, for, for the most part, these were relatively stable. So you can, uh, you can uh, express uh, real concern about what's happening in a household where uh, the, the, the parents are having to work harder and harder, scrimp, scrimp uh, uh, and save harder and harder to protect their children from the impact of um, uh, the deprivation that, that, that they're experiencing. Um, there, are, there are obviously indicators that you'd be more than familiar with which suggest serious deterioration for some, for some families um, in, in extreme circumstances. But what the chapter focuses on most of all, and again, we, we can come to this, to this in the discussion, is the prospects from here on out, uh, where it paints a very grim picture indeed, uh, focusing on the implications of the intended further, the cuts that have already been implemented, but the intended further cuts to social protection for working age families. In a context where now, of course, uh, inflation is, is going up significantly, has, has, has risen significantly, 
and the economic prospects, uh, are, alas, are, are all too uncertain. So in some sense, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the flavor of the chapter on the UK is um, that the progress registered in the previous decade up to the crisis uh, has, has stalled and is about to go into very serious reverse. The USA is a bit of a surprise, and I think it was actually a bit of a surprise even to the authors. Um, who, uh, Tim Smeeding, who's been writing about the US for uh, very many years, and, and his, his co-author. There was a sharp increase in unemployment <coughs> from a relatively low, low level for some, from some European perspectives is 5%, but doubled to 10%. But what's, what's really striking is that there was only a modest increase in income-based measures of, uh, of, of poverty for ch child households, an increase of the order of two percentage points from that high level of 27, 28% indeed, but in terms of the impact of the crisis itself, a, a modest enough increase. And what the, what the chapter brings out very well, and as I say, in some sense, you almost get the sense that the authors themselves are a bit surprised uh, to be telling this tale about the US, because as poverty researchers, they're used to standing up at things like this and having to apologize for uh, the very high level of poverty in, in the, and inequality in the US. But, but there were uh, two main planks to the policy response that were really fundamental. One was the fiscal stimulus that, um, that, that President Obama managed to get through, which was, you know, people, people complained it wasn't enough, but it, it made a very substantial difference to the macro impact uh, and, and severity and, and uh, depth, depth and persistence of the, the uh, economic crisis. But they also, uh, uh, there was a major expansion in income support in ways that you don't normally think about. So eligibility for unemployment benefit was greatly extended in terms of how long you could be from 26 weeks to 90 something. Um, entitlement to um, in-work income support was, was made significantly more generous. And uh, uh, um, idiosyncratic but very important support through um, food stamps was also made very much more widely available. So this probably, the, the summary that I quote here is, is I think, a fair, a fair enough summary. And as I say, I think you'll even read, read into the way this is phrased, the, the, the slight element of surprise on, on, on the part of the authors, to be actually telling a relatively um, positive story about the US. I won't, I won't dwell on my own country. It's, uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a small country um, out, out there in the Atlantic, which uh, went bust. Um, had to be bailed out, um, faced a, a, a very deep um, fiscal and debt crisis, and saw income, income poverty and deprivation soar, despite having uh, what, what now I think is a significantly more uh, generous and equally comprehensive social protection system to its, its close neighbor from which it initially inherited the system. Um, and what you, what you, so, so that brings out the point that I've made several times, that in the face of a very deep crisis, both in the macro economy and in the government finances, no matter how robust your social protection system is, it's not going to be able to bear the strain. And Ireland's wasn't. But what, what thankfully has, uh, has kicked in um, is uh, economic recovery. So uh, you've had a very substantial bounce uh, very marked decline in unemployment back down to traditionally much more usual levels and uh, the impact of cuts in public spending being being reversed and that's where all the political debate now is who 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 gets the spending is the current debate where the situation is very different in the remaining three countries that I'm going to get through very quickly Italy had a sustained a particularly sustained double dip recession and saw unemployment uh, rise very substantially and saw a substantial rise in income poverty and in these deprivation indicators, including in the Italian case, ones that relate specifically to children. What's very striking, but no surprise, I guess, is the scale of the regional divide, Whereas, where if you focus on southern Italy, you see um, 
this national income poverty uh, threshold um, that, that, that over half the population in the South, by the, the, the height of the crisis, were, were falling below that, that income threshold. So this, this is a very different social protection system to the, most of the ones we've been talking about so far, um, uh, with the possible exception of the US, in that it's, it's a highly fragmented, um, very patchy safety net, which privileges some beneficiaries, notably pensioners, and, and leaves significant numbers of unemployed uh, and, and, and families with children and little or no work um, with little or no income support. Uh, the situation has improved only marginally more recently, uh, and um, the, 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 the cry, if you like, from the chapter is that without, without a sustained resumption of economic growth, it's going to be very hard for Italy's protection, social protection system to be built up in the way that it needs to be and that its policy is now focused on doing. Spain, some similarities. Very deep initial in real income fall. Uh, very much more dramatic increase in unemployment even than Ireland. Uh, same sort of bailout. Um, same sort of uh, public finance crisis. Income poverty and deprivation, including child-related indicators, rose very sharply indeed. In this instance, again, Apache <laughs> social safety net, although not, not as, quite as patchy as Italy's, and, and uh, mostly because of improvements in, in the boom years, uh, uh, which, so like Ireland, Spain, and unlike Italy, Spain was coming into the crisis on the back of a very sustained uh, and substantial increase in real incomes, a uh, sustained boom. So you can argue that that's a rather different experience to Italy's, which is coming after a period of really quite sustained uh, stagnation. Some improvement, but really rather modest in very recent times. And then there's Greece, which is just a disaster uh, up to the present time. Um, very patchy social safety net, uh, very deep increases in income uh, poverty and deprivation. Deprivation levels for, for households with children in Greece are now approaching the levels in uh, Romania and Bulgaria, which are very much poorer countries. And no, little or no sign of improvement. In, in, in some plateauing is about the best you could, you could think to call it. So that gives me five minutes to tell you what I think the lessons are from this range of country experiences. And the first and obvious one, but it bears uh, re-emphasis, because poverty researchers like myself tend very often to take the macro economy as somebody else's business and somebody else's problem. But the reality here is that macro policies and outcomes really, really matter for children. So if you care about how children are protected in the next crisis, the best way to protect them is avoiding the next crisis might be optimistic, but moderating the next crisis is, is probably the single most important thing to think about. So what I've tried to bring out is how the macroeconomic response, as well as the initial nature of the crisis, varied really quite widely across countries. And some were very much more successful than others in moderating the impact. This included, importantly for the UK, in the approach they took to yawning fiscal deficits and public debt. How quickly and how those were addressed differed very widely across countries and had a major impact on multiple dimensions of uh, life for, for families. And I think it's worth, it's worth emphasis, and it was certainly a strong debate back in my home country, that even in the worst hit countries where there was ex very tight external constraint on uh, the scale and phasing of addressing fiscal deficits, the, 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 the Troika kept saying, how you do it is your business. We're not making your political choices for you. It's up to you how you do it, 
I, I see skepticism and, and it may be well merited, but they, the, there, were, there were choices open as to the balance, for example, between tax increases and uh, spending cuts and where those, where those impacted. So second, second lesson is that not only does the macro really matter, but what happens to employment, and particularly employment at the level of the household, is, is really key. This is, this is the core channel. It's not the only channel, but it's the core channel through which an economic crisis gets transmitted to, um, to, to, to families. And in many countries, households without work face a very high poverty risk. That poverty risk went up a bit in the crisis, but the main impact was the, simply the numbers in this situation went up a lot. And we've seen some examples where coordinated action of a sort that some countries can't even begin to think about, but others still manage, between employers, government, and unions, can minimize the impact. And even short of that, there are tools open to governments of the sort that I list on the bottom here um, to, to uh, affect how the increase uh, in, in uh, the, the, the labor market impact of the crisis uh, is, is minimized in terms of its impact on, on wages and household level uh, worklessness and poverty. But social protection is still at the core. I've been trying to emphasize it's not the only thing and can't be given the whole responsibility for dealing with, with poverty and, deal, and protecting children in a crisis, but it's still absolutely at the core. And what we've seen is the very wide degree of variation in, first of all, the capacity of social protection systems to deal with what were admittedly rather different crises, but also differences in the choices made. And here again, it's unusual to be pointing to the US, but in the US, choices made very substantially enhanced the capacity of the social protection system to protect children. Whereas in, in, in a, a range of other countries, Sometimes you might regard it as all, all but unavoidable, in others much less so, there were, there were significant cuts in spending on benefits for families with children, often while certainly not cutting, but, but in many cases increasing, spending on, on pensions. That's not to set this up as an as a, uh, elderly versus children um, uh, choice, but it's striking that the, this is the policy choice that was often made. So reinforcing social protection has to be at the heart of efforts to reinforce the capacity of, of rich countries to deal with a, a future crisis. Some suggestions there as to what that might look like um, and uh, what, I, what I don't think it looks like is a wholesale shift in the system to uh, relying ex very extensively on means testing in order to target resources. Experience of other countries suggests that that's not uh, 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 the, the, only, the only road to go. Haven't got time to talk about, but it's a big elephant in the room, the impact of public spending cuts outside the social protection system. Spending on health, spending on education, and often the invisible one, spending on social services. These have very real impacts on households with children, and one of the reasons that they get neglected, including in studies like this, is that they're very hard to measure. And we don't measure them at all as well as we do the impacts that I've been talking about. But that sure doesn't mean that they don't matter. So to finish, I think it's only fair to the rather, rather despairing Greek author to quote him, uh, because I think he's right in saying that the depth of the Greek crisis would have been too much for any social protection system, any welfare state more broadly, to cope with. Um, it's not to say Greece made all the right choices, but I think it's crucial as we look on from outside, potentially with some influence on how Greece gets treated by its European partners. And this, this crisis was simply much too deep and fundamental for the welfare system to, to cope with and has, uh, has enormously damaging and long-lasting effects. Some of these other country experiences, including indeed uh, uh, my own, 
um, are, are pretty sobering. But I hope I've convinced you, at least to the point that you go and look at the book, uh, that there are uh, some very important lessons to be learned by this sort of in-depth uh, perspective on individual country experiences, choices, and outcomes looked at in, in a common analytical frame. So I look forward to your reaction. Thank you. Um, so we're going to take some questions now, but can I just um, let you all know that it is being filmed and live webcast, so your questions will be uh, broadcast around the world, so please bear that in mind. <laughs> we we'll get it over with. Uh, David Hendry. Uh, Brian, one of the things you've, the elephant in the room you haven't discussed is currency unions. The fact that some of the countries like Greece and Ireland could not devalue to get round their problems, whereas Britain and obviously the US could. But the, one, one of the features is, if one thinks of the Great Depression in the US, it was much bigger than the Great Depression in Greece. But the US introduced a food program and food programs are not that expensive, and they have a huge impact on child poverty. And the US food stamps did part of that. And mm. it's a great pity that that wasn't adopted. I'm sure in Ireland and in Greece, it could have had a, a very big impact on the child side of pure poverty, where they can't even get enough to eat. Yeah, well, certainly on, on the first bit of on the currency union side of it, I guess, um, certainly you would, you would uh, uh, have no difficulty getting uh, a, a very substantial number of uh, folk from Ireland, Spain, uh, to, to, to sign up to the notion that currency union was critical in to the boom, which and the bur the bust. So without without that currency union, there wouldn't have been the scale of the increase in 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 debt uh, and house prices, and therefore the banks wouldn't have been as bust as they were, and households wouldn't be left with so much negative equity as they were. So that, that certainly uh, very substantially deepened the, the impact of the crisis. Um, but I guess uh, it's, it's when you look at Italy and Greece that you think that uh, the currency union is fundamental to the, uh, that, the crisis continuing. And I mean, view, views differ on you know, whether, whether Greece can, can really um, maintain his position in the currency union and have any hope of a significant recovery anytime soon. But, but the, the, whoever turns out to be right uh, on that, the price it has paid is, is just, uh, you know, we, we, we don't see anything like these numbers anywhere else. And to go to your point about food banks, I mean, and, and, and the, clear, the clear impact is very, very real hardship. For, for families with children. Now, I'm, I, I, I don't, there's no mention in the Greek analysis about uh, food banks. Uh, that, that may be one of the responses. But what certainly is, is part of the response is, is uh, help across the generations within families and essentially people relying on pensions uh, to, to feed the grandchildren. Um, and that's, that's, that, that's something that, that, is, that is not manifesting itself to anything like the same extent, even in hard hit countries like, like uh, Italy or Greece, uh, Italy or Spain. Thank you, Fran Bennett. Oxford University, thank you very much, Brian. Really fascinating. Um, I wanted to ask about tax, really, um, which you didn't mention very much. So I suppose, and that's for two reasons, and one, one is um, from the UK rather than international, I'm afraid, but the more general um, question would be that, as you say, there are policy choices here, and you know, if you think that the deficit's important and if you're trying to save money, then clearly one of the ways of doing that is to cut social benefits and another way of doing it is to increase taxation. And so I just wondered whether there was evidence in the chapters about increases in taxation which had um, affected families with children um, at the lower end of the income scale. And secondly, and it really is about choices again, um, the social policy in a cold climate study from the LSE uh, has recently shown that if you take account of inflation and you look at the um, uh, what happened between 2010 and 2014-15, i.e. the coalition government, um, then virtually all the benefit cuts, the revenue from that, was virtually all spent on cuts in direct taxation and did not actually contribute to cutting the deficit at all. 
um, and therefore those policy choices and the um, impact of that on child poverty is, uh, is absolutely crucial, I think. Yep, ab absolutely. Um, so, so I guess the, the, the main way in which tax features in, in, these, in most of these chapters is, is when it comes to the policy choices in terms of the balance between tax increases and spending cuts. That's, that's the main uh, uh, debate, if you like. But, but there are a number of countries, um, including, including Hungary, including uh, Ireland, where um, the, the scale of tax increases was such that, unlike other countries, it actually impacted right down the income distribution, including, including those in, in poverty. Um, and uh, in, in Ireland, uh, a, a, a very controversial, although I must say I'm quite supportive of it myself, um, new, new social charge was introduced that almost everybody paid and that made a major contribution to closing, closing the fiscal deficit. So you can argue that in the absence of those sorts of tax increases, welfare cuts would have, would have had to be bigger. Now, those welfare cuts might well have been to pensions, which weren't cut. Uh, in, in either Hungary or, or Ireland, um, rather than to uh, further deeper cuts to working age benefits. Um, but it's interesting that chi child benefit in particular tends to be an easy target for some reason in, in these situations. And that goes back to these never-ending debates about whether everybody should be receiving, or most people should be receiving these sorts of universal payments. And, and so the, you know, the, the uh, the, the depth of the conviction and the belief in the, in, in, in the um, appropriateness of having that structure uh, when tested, that, that, that seems to be uh, often, often a bit fragile. Um, so uh, UK case is, is, is a very special one uh, and for the reasons you mentioned um, in that uh, in, in most of the countries where there were really swinging tax increases, and there, there was really little or no choice. Um, and it really was a question of, um, if, if you don't do this, you're gonna have to cut, you're gonna have to more, cut more spending. Here it was, it was much more, as you know better than I do. Uh, but as the chapter certainly argues very strongly, it was more, uh, it was a policy choice. It was, a, as, the, as the chapter, as Jonathan argues, it was an ideologically framed policy choice. And, and the chapter has some interesting things to say as to why that would have uh, would have would have had some purchase uh, because it because it, it probably wouldn't uh, a lot of other places. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. Certainly, viewed from New Zealand, the Greek story is quite chilling given that the architects of our 1990 policy reforms were in Greece at the time, urging Greece to go harder. Really a kind of a policy violence. But what I wanted to ask you or press you on is this question of recovery. And it's probably beyond the scope of the book, but when you speak about these countries recovering, what are your own reflections about the effect on particular cohorts of this sort of policy violence, and also thinking about situations like Spain, where they may have lost a cohort in immigration. You know, when we speak of recovery, what are we talking about, or the limits of it? Yeah, and, and that, that's, a, that's a, a very good question. Um, Clearly, in the countries, in at least in the countries in the bottom half of this uh, of this ranking, if you like, um, th there are e even in even in the relatively rapidly recovering ones, um, like, like Ireland, there there are going to be very long term um, uh, lasting impacts of the crisis, and um, in terms of levels of public debt, not least, and the levels of taxation, taxation that are going to be required to pay them off, um, in terms of household level indebtedness, uh, which it takes an awfully long time to work through, uh, and most particularly in terms of the impact on young people who in other circumstances would have been expecting to come on the labor market and into jobs. So um, depending on the country and the context and their own level of education and circumstances, um, some, some of those have more options than others. 
Um, one option that, that, that you, know, you, like I, will be well familiar with is getting on a plane. Uh, uh, but pr studies of previous, much more modest recessions uh, show a, 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 a career-lasting impacts of coming on the labor market in, in, in circumstances that were bad, but not, not as bad, not nearly as bad as, as uh, young people in some of these countries have had to face. So, so I think, alas, there's, um, there's every reason to think that even though in some, though not all of these countries, household incomes have now for the most part returned to at least the level uh, that they started at in 2008, in which case you can still talk about a lost, not quite decade, but all but, you've, you've lost the growth that would otherwise have been expected over that period. Um, but even in those circumstances, which doesn't apply uh, in most, most obviously in Greece, and you're looking at long, very long-lasting effects of, of the sort you mentioned. But again, there are policy choices and there are options for trying to direct resources and uh, uh, retraining opportunities. Um, the EU had its uh, youth employment guarantee, which you know rolled out very differently in different countries, but was nonetheless at least you know more than more than a gesture to try and direct resources and make a commitment to to young people in in that situation. So it's not as if there's nothing that one can do, uh, but it's very hard to make up that ground, you know, five or ten years later. Um, okay, Brian, um, thank you very much for a, a very interesting talk. Uh, I would be interested to learn whether uh, the uh, extremely uh, high levels of uh, poverty in um, southern Europe are showing up in um, health and uh, mortality statistics uh, and whether they're <coughs> impacting uh, in a measurable way on uh, children's intellectual development. I don't know that they are. What the indicators available do show is that certainly in terms of, for example, I think I threw up, it was on a slide there, and um, one of the things that the Greek chapter emphasizes is um, clear increase in the um, inability to afford getting, med getting basic or medic get medical care. People not going to the doctor because they can't afford it. Not bringing their children to the doctor because they can't afford it. Um, so, you know, your, your expectation would be that that would indeed feed through in, in, in due course to worsening health outcomes and, and very particularly widening, widening health inequalities. Obviously, that's a strong debate here in the UK as to whether health inequalities are widening. Um, but certainly in these countries, you would, you would expect, at best, a widening in inequalities and, at worst, a serious deterioration in the absolute outcomes uh, for, for poor children. Okay, I'm afraid we're going to have to and I know that. <laughs> There's going to be one more question that, because Claire has promised someone. Please. Thank you, Brian. Um, John Hoffmeyer from Oxford. Does it feel uh, to you that for those of us that um, uh, may be young enough to think about coming back 10 or 15 years from now, whether, whether we wouldn't just be having the same conversation again uh, after another major recession? And, does it feel to you that some kind of really radical reform, like having employees own businesses where the research shows that, in fact, people share in the cuts um, rather than laying off um, people, they'll go to 30-hour work weeks or 25-hour work weeks? I think, I think there's every reason to be concerned about another finance-driven crisis. Uh, and certainly those who, who write in a much more informed uh, fashion than I would about the, the uh, re-regulation of the financial sector in the wake of the crisis. Uh, many, many of them seemed uh, convinced that uh, that hasn't gone anywhere near far enough. Um, and that we, we certainly we have every reason to worry about uh, It'll, it'll be a different crisis, but it could, it could very well be a, another finance-driven crisis. Um, in terms of the 
but, but you know, so what we're trying to point to here is some of some of the some of the priorities in in thinking about minimizing the macro impact and the impact on household incomes for families. Um, I'm I'm not sure that there's been enough experience with employee-owned businesses to know whether the statement that you make is generalizable, and uh, because there aren't there aren't enough of them, and it's it's an interesting way to think about it. But obviously, in, in some countries, a degree of coordination uh, between organized labor and employers, uh, with, the, with the government holding the ring and injecting resources, has, has been, you know, not just Germany, uh, uh, Belgium as well, has, has been really important. And I'm not sure that um, you know, one should give up on that. OK, now we are going to draw to a close. And uh, there were some more hands, but. Um there will be little time afterwards. Um, but before we close, and before we thank Brian uh, once more, I would just like to draw your attention to some other forthcoming events. Uh, this Thursday, um, uh, in this room, 5 o'clock, um, we will hear from Professors Doan Farmer and Cameron Hepburn um, on tipping points to the post-carbon society. That's a sort of advanced launch of a new Oxford Martin program on uh, the post-carbon society. And talking specifically about what they're terming sensitive intervention points of ways in which we may be able to do small-scale actions that will, will achieve large impact and move us uh, forward um, beyond our current preoccupation with, um, with carbon-based fuels. Um, the following week, um, on the 16th of November, Professor Steve Cowley, our acting director, will talk on the energy transition when is the question he will try and answer, specifically looking um, at the role of nuclear energy in the energy transition. And just to draw your attention to one other talk on a very different topic at the end of the month, on 30th of November at 5 o'clock, um, the future of women in Africa. Um, professors Joe Boyden and Sandy Fredman uh, will be talking specifically um, about women aged 15 to 24 um, on the continent um, and under the title Production, Reproduction and Empowerment. So now um, we will have um, a book signing next door, and more importantly, perhaps, all of you are invited to turn right as we exit and to have a drink with Brian and to um, ply him with more questions. So if we could just thank Brian once more. Thank you very much. <laughs>